This is a paper called The Dream Work of Sigmund Freud in Art and Architecture for a symposium on the role of the unconscious in the architectural imagination sponsored by the Institute for Psychoanalytic Studies in Architecture. My name is John Shannon Hendricks. The distinction between the Lacanian imaginary and symbolic and the preservation of the imaginary in the symbolic is played out in the dream work described by Sigmund Freud in the interpretation of dreams, on dreams, introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, and an outline of psychoanalysis. The dream is not the unconscious, as both Freud and Lacan maintain, although it is seen to reveal the structure of the unconscious and from the outset, Freud's analysis is of the memory of the dream rather than the dream itself. The dream is thus seen as a nemic residue of perception. The content of the memory of the dream is labeled the manifest content of the dream, and the product of the conceptual analysis of the dream is labeled the latent content or dream thought of the dream. The latent content of the dream is not a content of the memory of the dream itself, but something which is ascribed to it by conscious thought. <clears throat> dream work is the process which transforms the supposed latent content of the dream into the manifest content, the process by which the dream is generated as imagined by Freud in the supposition that it is generated from unconscious thought, or as would be the case for Lacan, the discourse of the other. The structures of both unconscious thought and symbolic discourse contain particular linguistic constructions, as both are languages, the relations of which can be found in the relations between images and the manifest content of the dream. Lacan does not pursue dream analysis and psychoanalysis, but he adopts many of Freud's linguistic analogies from dream analysis and conceiving of the relation between the imaginary and symbolic. <clears throat> Freud sees a direct relationship between the dream thought and the dream content in the same way as there is a direct relationship between the signifier and the signified in the structural linguistics of Ferdinand de Saussure as two sides of a piece of paper, more or less, and the transcription between the two is governed by a linguistic syntax, a complex system of rules which operates according to a logic which does not always correspond to conscious reason. The mechanisms of representation, as they are developed between the dream thought and the dream image, are different from conscious mechanisms of representation in the intersection of perception and language, although the nemic residues of dream memories are derived from those of external perception, and the linguistic mechanisms of representation in the unconscious are derived from conscious language. Unconscious mechanisms are seen as a variation of conscious mechanisms not under the control of conscious reason. In that way, they can be seen in the Lacanian sense as a discourse of the other, the big other, the mechanisms of the symbolic transposed into a deep structure, intersecting with the mechanisms of the imaginary and the identification between the subject and the dream image. As is often said, the ego is always present in the dream, the insertion of the perceiving subject into the unconscious mechanisms of language and perception. Such a relationship becomes problematic in Lacanian psychoanalysis and the quadrature of the subject and the attempt to show the elision of the subject and signification, which requires a distinction between the symbolic and the imaginary ego, a distinction which does not exist in dream work because of the immediate identification between thought and image, signifier and signified, as in Saussurean li linguistics, which is subverted by Lacan and the resistance of the signifier to the signified in conscious discourse and the discourse of the big other. <clears throat> Thus, for Lacan, the unconscious cannot be anything other than the discourse of the big other, and a theory of dream analysis is not formulated outside of conscious experience. If it were, it would be nothing other than a repetition of conscious experience and constructs. The big other would be the network of relationships which forms the unconscious. Dream thoughts and dream content are for Freud in the interpretation of dreams, two versions of the same subject matter presented in two different languages in a kind of transcript 
whose characters and syntactic laws it is our business to discover by comparing the original and the translation. Dream content is seen as a pictographic script, as Freud describes, the characters of which have to be transposed individually into the language of dream thoughts in a signifying relation. Relations between dream images depend on relations between dream thoughts as a kind of deep structure syntactical matrix. There's no direct relationship between sequences of image in dream, images and dreams and thought processes in the dream thoughts, which leads Freud to a conclusion which would suggest that there is no unconscious thought per se, but only mimetic repetitions and reproductions of thoughts, which correspond to mimetic reproductions of images and perception, the nemic residues. The unconscious doesn't think in a way corresponding to conscious reason. It is as a monkey, as a sort of primordial form of conscious reason, imitating actions which are products of linguistic concepts, but whose actions are not connected to any linguistic concepts of its own. The mechanism of the transposition from dream thoughts to dream images is labeled imagination, and the mental activity, which may be described as imagination, is liberated from the domination of reason and from any moderating control, Freud says. Dream imagination makes use of recent waking memories for its building material, in mimesis and repetition, and it erects them into structures bearing not the remotest resemblance to those of waking life. A Lacanian revision of Freud would suggest that the structures of dream images, if they can be seen as structures, are not erected by dream thoughts, but rather transposed. Dream imagination is without the power of conceptual speech, as Freud says, and has no concepts to exercise an attenuating influence, thus being obliged to paint what it has to say pictorially. This would confirm the absence of thinking in the unconscious. There is a contradiction between Freud's theory of the perception consciousness system, which maintains the existence of unconscious thought, and Freud's theory of dream work, which, while maintaining references to the existence of unconscious thought, suggests its impossibility. The linguistic structure of the dream image is seen as diffuse, clumsy, and awkward. It is clearly missing the organization of conscious reason, while its forms are mimetic of it. If the unconscious is the discourse of the other, the big other in Lacanian terms, it is only insofar as it is a mimesis of the discourse of the big other. Dreams have no means at their disposal for representing these logical relations between the dream thoughts, Freud says, or for representing logical relations between conscious thoughts, the relations created by syntactical rules. Dream images are compared to the visual arts and their incapacity to incorporate to any significant degree the syntactical structures of language. The desire on the part of the visual arts, in particular architecture, to engage as much as possible the syntactical structures of language reflects the desire on the part of the arts to interweave the imaginary and the symbolic in Lacanian terms, in the complete constitution of the subject. In Freudian dream analysis, dreams remain a function of the imaginary rather than symbolic in the projection of the ego in a pre-linguistic identification. <clears throat> Thinking does not occur in the dreams themselves either, according to Freud. Any thought processes which might be perceived in memories of dreams are only a mimicking of thought processes which occur in the dream thoughts, which are themselves a mimicking of conscious thought processes. Dreams are thus thrice removed from reality, as the visual arts are for Plato, forms which are copies of sensible forms, which are copies of intelligible forms. If we go into the interpretation of dreams such as these, Freud says, we find that the whole of this is part of the material of the dream thoughts and is not a representation of intellectual work performed during the dream itself. Thus, what is re reproduced by the ostensible thinking in the dream is the subject matter of the dream thoughts and not the mutual relations between them, the assertion of which constitutes thinking. Dream images constitute a kind of facade and a form of deception. They are the luminous embroidered veil of Plato hanging between the finite and the infinite, between the images which are nemic residues of perceived images, and the thoughts which, if they exist in the unconscious, are themselves nemic residues of auditory, auditory forms. <clears throat>
The memory of the dream image enacts the same dialectic as is found in metaphysics in conscious thought, the distinction between that which is perceived and that which is conceived, which is at the core of the dialectic of the imaginary and symbolic of Lacan. Any thought activity represented in dreams is represented as having already been completed, according to Freud. So thought activity, whether conscious or unconscious, is crystallized into a structure in the dream, made abstract and made synchronic. Dreams can in that way be seen as another product of the death instinct, the desire to return to that more primordial form of conscious reason, which is defined as mimesis. A contradiction in a dream, for example, cannot correspond to a contradiction in a conceptual sequence, which is a product of the dream analysis. The logic of the dream is independent of conscious logic. There is an approximation of a conceptual contradiction, though, to the extent that mimesis would allow given its limitations. Any correspondence between conceptual structures would only be an indirect one. Different dreams vary the clarity of their correspondence with conceptual structures. Some seem to correspond fairly clearly, which can easily be a deception, and others make no sense at all. Different dreams would appear to contain varying degrees of the symbolic in relation to the imaginary as they are interwoven. Chronological sequences occur in dreams as imitations of chronological sequences and conceptual thought. They have no logic of their own, and any correspondence with conceptual chronological sequences is an accident. <clears throat> Di diachronic sequences, as they are understood in conscious reason, may as a result be compressed into synchrotic events or images, or they may be fragmented or reversed in a logic which might correspond to the dream image in relation to the symbolic or the discourse of the big other and the interaction of the ego and the subject and the symbolic structure in which it is participating, <clears throat> but not to conscious reason. In other words, because conscious reason is itself a function of the symbolic, the discourse of the big other, the language in the unconscious, in Lacanian terms, it is not in control of the structure of the dream, which is also a function of the big other. Any logic which can be found in correspondence between conscious reason and the dream is the logic of the big other, the linguistic matrix, in which perception participates, and thus endemic residues in dreams in the symbolic, or the unconscious. Freud points to the synchrotic representation of diachronic sequences in painting in the Parnassus in the School of Athens of Raphael Osanzio, for example, as evidence of the same process in conscious representation, which is a form of abstraction, a product of conscious reason in a linguistic structure in its ordering of that which is perceived in the primacy of the symbolic over the imaginary. The dialectic between the two mechanisms, the diachronic sequences of conscious reason and the characteristics of dream construction, consists of the dialectic between the hierarchy, unity, sequence, and progression of conscious thought and the fragmentation, disjunction, contingency, alternation, slippage, and oscillation, all of which can be found to be characteristics of dream compos composition, the result of the alternate logic of the big other in the unconscious. <clears throat> The simultaneity of the conscious and unconscious necessitates an oscillating reading. The presence of the unconscious is revealed, revealed as that which is incompatible with conscious reason in the subject, which results in a continuous oscillation of presence, as language itself, as Derrida and Lacan have shown, is a continual oscillation of presence and absence. Though the conceptual correspondence is arbitrary, the structuring of dream images, as described by Freud, corresponds fairly closely to linguistic structures, from which Lacan concludes that the unconscious is structured like a language, and it is safe to conclude that the unconscious is nothing other than the mimesis of language. Freud points out that the rules of collocation and dream images correspond to the rules of collocation and language. Dream images are distinct from one another in the same way that words are distinct from one another in a sequence, and the logic behind the combination is usually evident, a structural logic as one that corresponds to the logic behind word combinations and sentences. Dreams seem to obey a grammatical and syntactical structure, 
regardless of whether a sense can be derived from them, which corresponds to conscious reason. In that way, dream images can be seen as pictorial equivalents of signifiers. They operate independently of the dream thoughts that they are supposedly attached to. <clears throat> and any signification which they produce is a product of their combinations as systems of differences in the syntax as in structural linguistics. Freud points out that dreams have no intention of communicating anything, so it is most likely that they produce no signification. Such communication would require a recognizable syntactical structure that corresponds to conscious logic, which does not exist in dreams, despite the periodic correspondences and similarities which are produced in imitation of relations and logic. One example of the inability of dreams to correspond to conscious reasoning in addition to the lack of distinction between the synchrotic and diachronic, is the simultaneity of contraries and contradictions. Opposite forms are combined into a single form, or appear as the same form, or form might be replaced by its opposite, or represented by its opposite. There is no distinction between positive and negative, no sign of any conclusion that might be drawn from conceptual thought as given in the syntactical structure of language. Freud points out that the same quality can be found in certain words in archaic languages. In Latin, for example, altus means both high and deep, and sacer means both sacred and accursed. In certain words in ancient Egyptian, the order of the sounds in a word can be reversed while keeping the same meaning, as described in the introductory lectures on aesthetic, on psychoanalysis. Archaic languages betray vagueness in a variety of ways which we would not tolerate in our writing today, Freud says. Current languages vary widely in their ambiguity. The Italian language, for example, has many fewer words available to it than the English language. As a result, words in the Italian language often have more than one meaning, and the language requires more words in a sentence to express the same idea that would be expressed in English. The same kind of reversals occur in dream images. The conceptual structure of the order has no importance, which is readily discernible by conscious reasoning. Dreams display the coincidentia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites. The coincidentia oppositorum is seen as the dialectic of becoming in reason, and the development from the particular to the universal, which is pre-existent in it. Representation in dreams, according to Freud, is often facilitated by replacement as in a coincidentia positorum or condensation. When a common element between two persons is represented in a dream, it is usually a hint for us to look for another concealed common element whose representation has been made impossible by the censorship, as Freud writes. A displacement in regard to the common element has been made in order, as it were, to facilitate its representation. As the Khan has shown, that is precisely the mechanism of metaphor in the alighting of the first signified, which produces the anchoring point, the point at which signification is produced and the bar between the signifier and signified is crossed, and the point at which the unconscious is made present as an absence. Displacement has also been seen to be a mechanism in architectural composition. This is one of many examples in Freud's dream interpretation, which points to the linguistic structuring of dream images. The two principal mechanisms of the formation of dream images are displacement and condensation. Displacement is responsible for the fact that dream images do not correspond to conscious reason, and causes the dream to be seen as nothing more than a distortion or perversion of reason, a deceptive facade, as an architecture. Lacan has shown that displacement is a primary mechanism of both metaphor and metonymy in language, and that it results as a figurative or poetic signification or effect in language, which goes beyond its literal function and introduces the unconscious, as in the case of metaphor, a distorted signification, and in the case of the metonym, displacement results in pure nonsense. In such a mechanism, a dream can be seen as a form of tropic language whose logical sense is removed from rational discourse. The other principal mechanism in dream formation is condensation, which involves the coincidentia oppositorum, the representation of two contrary ideas by the same structure, 
as well as the diachronic uh, combined into, into the synchrotic and collective and composite figures. Condensation is the most active mechanism in dream formation, as in dreams, fresh composite forms are being perpetually constructed in an inexhaustible variety, as described by Freud in On Dreams. In condensation, the dream image is overdetermined by material in the dream thoughts or in the mnemic residue of visual or auditory perception, as it were. A single dream image may be the combination of several pictorial or linguistic forms which have no apparent relation to each other, as in the play of difference in signification or difference. Condensation is, of course, the mechanism of synecdoche, which Lacan confuses with metonymy and tropic language. In synecdoche, a single word serves as a substitute for several words or a complex idea. Condensation is thus another form of displacement and can be seen as a mechanism of metaphor and metonymy as well. The condensation and displacement, which Freud observes as characteristics of the dream image, lend to the theory that the dream is a pictorial language, that the unconscious is structured like a language. <clears throat> the composition, structure, and sign significance of the dream are all given by conscious thought and analysis. While the particular quality of the relationships between images in the dreams is created by mechanisms which can be compared to linguistic mechanisms which are censored by conscious thought. Dream work thus provides a key to the relation between the symbolic and the imaginary, to the relation between perception and consciousness and sense experience in the primordial imaginary and object identification and imaginary ego formation. Though there is a direct correspondence between the dream thought and the dream image for Freud, the construction of the dream entails a more complex relationship between the thought or mnemic residue and the image. As is seen in condensation and displacement, as Freud describes, just as connections lead from, from each element of the dream to several dream thoughts, so as a rule, a single dream thought is represented by more than one dream element. The threads of association do not simply converge from the dream thoughts to the dream content. They cross and interweave with each other many times over in the course of their journey. A similar concept can be found in the floating kingdoms of Ferdinand de Saussure, the realm of signifieds or conceptual networks of signifiers in relation to the realm of the signifiers or the words, where while there is no direct physical relationship between the signifier and the signified, they join between the two realms in a complex network of relationships, and it is particular occurrences within the network of relationships which engender signification. In the course in general linguistics, a linguistic system is a series of differences of sound combined with a series of differences of ideas. But the pairing of a certain number of acoustical signs with as many cuts made from the mass of thought engenders a system of values and this system serves as the effective link between the phonic and psychological elements within each sign. The relations between the dream thoughts and the dream images can be seen as a series of differences combined with a series of differences in which the pairing, identical or otherwise, of a particular image with a particular concept might be taken as a linguistic sign, which contains a signifier and a signified, or they can just be seen as coincidences of systems of differences. The displacement which occurs in dreams is responsible for distorting, more than anything else, the psychical intensity of the thoughts or mnemic residues which correspond to the dreams, according to Freud. The psychic intensity is described as the significance or effective potentiality of the thought or perceptual trace. The system of differences between the traces is a system of intensities as much as a system of signifiers or more because of the nature of the relation between the mnemic residue and perception. Some images or words are perceived at a different level of intensity than others, more clearly or more loudly, etc., and it stands to reason that the variations in intensities would be translated in the composition of the dream images, and that those variations would be uh, illegible in relation to any conceptual structure. In the course of this process, Freud says the psychical intensity significance or effective potentiality of the thoughts is, as we further find, transformed into sensory vividness. <clears throat>
As a result of the complex network of psychical relationships which produce the dream images and the mechanisms of condensation and displacement, dreams are composed of disconnected fragments of visual images, speeches, and even uh, bits of unmodified, unmodified thoughts, Freud says, which stand in the most manifold logical relation to one another, which are seen, for example, as foreground and background conditions, digressions and illustration, change of ed evidence and counter arguments. The network of logical relations which contribute to the composition of dream images is far too complex to be unraveled in dream analysis. Displacement, condensation, fragmentation, substitution, and the coincidentia positorum are products of the complex network of logical relations or the mnemic residues of such in dream thoughts, which is too complex to correspond to any logical structure. In the process of the dream formation, the logical links which have hitherto held the psychical material together are lost, as Freud describes. It is the task of analysis to restore the logical connections which the dream work has destroyed, as dreams are seen as the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind and the interpretation of dreams, and access to psychical mechanisms which psychoanalysis seeks to understand. Lacanian psychoanalysis furthers this quest in the analysis of the linguistic mechanisms of which dreams are a product. In that the dream is always a function of the subject, or the ego of the subject, that the dream is always in relation to the subject, the dream must be seen as a function of the symbolic, as the linguistic mechanism. Although the dream has no intention of communicating anything, it is nevertheless a product of the relation of the subject to itself, a product of the insertion of the subject into the symbolic <clears throat> and the insertion of the sub symbolic in imaginary self-definitions and the intersection of the symbolic in imaginary self-definitions of the subject. To that degree, the dream functions as a signifying process as does language. It is only a self-referential language, but it is constructed as a mimesis of interpersonal language. The dream is a representation of the subject to itself as a contract construct of the symbolic as the unconscious is the discourse of the big other. The dream is the big other speaking to the subject. The dream behaves toward the dream content lying before it, just as our normal psychical activity behaves in general toward any perceptual content that may be presented to it, Freud says. It understands that content on the basis of certain anticipatory ideas and arranges it even at the moment of receiving it on the presupposition of its being intelligible. This is exactly the way that Lacan described signification at the moment of the entry of the subject into the signifying chain. In the signifying chain of Lacan, the point at which the alighted subject is identified, as in the metaphor, is the point at which the relation between the alighted subject and ideal ego, the imaginary ego prior to the symbolic, is intersected by the vector of enunciation in the L schema, which occurs only retroactively in the signifying chain, in anticipation of signification, as a subject in the dream anticipates signification and perception. The point is the anchoring, anchoring point, the point du capiton, and the diachronic function of this anchoring point is to be found in the sentence, as Lacan describes, even if the sentence completes its signification only with its last term, each term being anticipated in the construction of the others, and inversely, sealing their meaning by its retroactive effect. Dream construction, like the signifying chain in language, must be supported by a self-conception of the subject as ideal ego. But the conception of the subject can never be realized. It is always an expectation, and the subject can only identify itself after the fact of enunciation. <clears throat> this is borne out by the fact that though the dream only functions in relation to the subject, the subject is never present in the dream. In the dream, as in language, this is a retroversion effect by which a subject becomes at each stage what he was before and announces himself he will have been only in the future perfect tense, Lacan says. The imaginary ideal ego of the subject is the body of the subject, as it is reinforced in object identification with the body of the other person. As the subject is absent from the dream, as it is absent from conscious discourse, <clears throat> and is only present in anticipation. <clears throat>
as the imaginary and symbolic interact and constitute the whole of conscious experience, the object identification of the imaginary is preserved as a vestige or fragment in the symbolic, and the symbolic is preserved in the imaginary in the matrix of the other. Such identifications cannot be abandoned completely, just subsumed into the matrix of both conscious and unconscious identity, and remove from their dominant position and the identity of the subject. In the anticipation of the dream content by the dream, according to Freud, the dream runs a risk of falsifying it, and in fact, if it cannot bring it into line with anything familiar, is a prey to the strangest misunderstandings. As is well known, we are capable of seeing a series of unfamiliar signs or of hearing a succession of unknown words without at once falsifying the perception from considerations of intelligibility on the basis of something already known to us. As Freud describes in On Dreams. For Lacan, this would make it impossible for the subject to recognize itself in the dream, as the subject is not able to recognize itself in architecture, and it would be at this point that the ambiguity of a failure to recognize that is essential to knowing myself is introduced, Lacan says. For in this rear view, <coughs> oh, all that the subject can be certain of is the anticipated image coming to meet him, <coughs> which is absent in the dream. The anticipated image is the imaginary vector between the elided subject and the ego ideal, which is announced as the absence of the subject in language, and crossing the bar between signifier and signified, but bars the subject from its own absence, the unconscious, in not being able to cross the bar at the same time as a metaphor. In this way, the unconscious is present in the dream as well. In terms of revealing both conscious and unconscious, symbolic and imaginary, mechanisms in the subject for Freud. <clears throat> a dream that resembles a disordered heap of dis disconnected fragments is just as valuable as one that has been beautifully polished and provided with a surface as described with on dreams, if not more so, given the deception of conscious reason. Dream is nothing other than condensation and displacement, that is, the mechanisms of language enacted to replay nemic residues of visual and auditory perceptions for no communicative purposes. In the condensation and displacement, words and images are taken out of the context in which they are perceived, as submitted to the mechanisms of conscious thought, and they are freely recombined and substituted in a mimetic process. As opposed to waking thought, the nature of which is to establish order in material of that kind, to set up relations in it, and to make it conform to our expectations of an intelligible whole, as Freud describes, <clears throat> dreams are not subject to the orderings of conscious thought, and thus produce both chronological and pictorial hybridizations, as well as displacements and distortions of what is perceived according to conscious mechanisms. In that way, dreams are per perception minus conscious thought, while the mechanism of dreams, the underlying linguistic structure, is the same. In this way, the dream is the discourse of the big other, and the unconscious is structured like a language. The mechanisms of language are not necessarily conscious mechanisms, and in that way, it is the subject which is the product of language, rather than language which is a product of the subject. The language of which the subject is a product is the language of the big other, which is the unconscious. When memories of dreams are analyzed, they are submitted to conscious reason and are thus distorted and misunderstood. The language of the big other is not completely accessible to conscious thought. It is not possible for conscious reason to completely understand the matrix of interpersonal relations which constitutes the big other and the unconscious. In the Hegelian dialectic between subjective and objective spirit, objective spirit or conscious discourse is seen as a manifestation, manifestation of subjective spirit. The individual subject wills itself into the big other in order to define itself through reason. Subjective spirit is defined by Hegel in the phenomenology of spirit as individual self-consciousness, which becomes objective spirit through collective picture thinking, <clears throat> collective reason and perception, which Lacan would define as the big other. <clears throat>
Hegel sees perception as a function of subjective spirit, desire, and self-consciousness. In reason and history, ego is defined as the desire of the subjective spirit to become objective spirit. Self-knowing subjectivity projects itself into all objectivity, Hegel says. This constitutes the ego's certainty of its own existence. <clears throat> Inasmuch as this subjectivity has no other content, it must be called the rational desire. This is the sphere of its phenomenality. It wills itself in its particularity. If it succeeds in thus realizing its finiteness, it doubles itself. Its potential finiteness becomes actual finiteness. The externalization of subjective spirit as other person and the self-consciousness of the subjective as the other person or object in language is picture thinking or vorstelung <coughs> or perception as given by reason and signification. The externalization is a, an alteration of the content of subjectivity through misunderstanding, the impossibility of knowing the subjective and the objective as the big other. Subjective spirit becomes objective spirit when mind comes to know itself as its own other, double of itself. This, thus it is impossible for reason to identify itself in the big other, though it is given by the big other, or the symbolic, as it is impossible to recognize itself in the dream or the unconscious. For Freud, then, there is no doubt that it is our normal thinking that is the psychical agency which approaches the content of dreams with the demand that it must be intelligible, which subjects it to a first interpretation and which consequently produces a complete misunderstanding of it. The production of dream thoughts must then be seen as external to the dream, as that which conscious reason projects onto the dream through the desire of subjective spirit becoming objective spirit and the desire of the subject to insert itself into the big other as a thinking subject. The ego of the subjective spirit is the ego of the imaginary, the self-imposition of the subject into the dream prior to its analysis. However many interesting and puzzling questions the dream thoughts may involve, Freud says, such questions have, after all, no special relations to dreams and do not call for treatment among the problem of dreams. The dream thoughts are not only external to the dream, but they have no particular relationship with it. The symbolic is external to the imaginary as a result of the will of subjective spirit towards objective spirit and its doubling of itself in reason as a result, the self-alienation, misrecognition, or méconnaissance of the process of which it is, uh, it is a result that is that it is a product of the big other. Though there is not a direct relationship between dream content and the dream thought, which is the intervention of conscious reason, there is a correspondence in dreams between the image and the imaginary in the word and the symbolic, a correspondence which is given by the underlying syntactical structure of the dream, the presence of the unconscious. Freud gives as an example of correspondences between images and linguistic structures the frequent occurrence of houses and parts of houses and dreams. The house is seen in dream interpretation to be a symbol of the body, as the fortress might be a symbol of the ego. But Freud also observes the correspondence between the occurrence of the house in the dream and the use of the house in tropic language, in metaphorical and metonymical figures of speech in the German language. But the same symbolism is found in our linguistic usage, Freud says, when we greet an acquaintance familiarly as an altus house or an old house, when we speak of giving someone eins auf Daki, a knock on the head, literally, one on the roof, or when we say of someone else that he's not quite right in the upper story. In anatomy, the orifices of the body are in so many words termed Liebensporten, literally portals of the body. It is clear that the mechanisms of metaphor and metonymy, crucial in the access to the unconscious for Lacan, <clears throat> are in operation visually in dreams as transpositions from mnemic residues of auditory perceptions to visual images. Certainly the obverse would be the case as well, that relationships between the mnemic residues of visual images are transposed into auditory images and dreams, which gives an indication of the complexity of the underlying linguistic matrix, which connects dreams with conscious thought 
and which connects the unconscious with the conscious, and which establishes the importance of the unconscious in the definition of the subject as a product of the big other. The linguistic structures themselves must be subject to condensation, displacement, and distortion, which makes their presence even more obscure. Condensation occurs in language use and slips of the tongue, for example, in which neologisms are created, which display an unintentional repression, which reveals the presence of the unconscious in language. An example is, according to Freud, the young man who offered to Big Light Diggin, Big Lighten meaning to accompany, and Big Lighted again meaning to insult, uh, a lady. The same mechanisms occur in dream images as they are transform, transformed from mnemic residues of auditory perceptions and they are combined and interwoven with straightforward transpositions of linguistic structures, rendering them virtually impossible to translate. In addition, for Freud, a manifest element may correspond simultaneously to several latent ones, and contrarywise, a latent element may play a part in several manifest ones. There is, as it were, a crisscross relationship. As a result, an attempted translation of a dream can never be literal nor follow a fixed set of rules. The signifying chain in language and the production of metaphor, metonymy, and tropic language, for example, depends on an unbroken rational sequence in order to arrive at the point de capiton, the point of signification in Lacan's scheme, at which the subject enters into the sequence's absence. Even in neologisms, jokes, and metonyms, which make no literal sense, rational discourse is maintained. The same is not true for the language of dreams, but at the same time, dreams cannot be seen as a rational babble. In displacement in language, in metonymy, for example, which entails the production of nonsense, an allusion is required for the metonym to make sense as nonsense. The foot of a hill makes no sense literally, <clears throat> but it makes sense in its nonsense because there is a prior relationship between the foot and the hill. The hill can be seen as a body. In waking thought, the illusion must be easily intelligible, and the substitute must be related in its subject matter, <coughs> in its sub subject matter to the genuine genuine thing it stands for. Freud says. The precondition of intelligibility and the precondition of association, which all must always be present for language to function. The same is not true in dreams. There is no precondition of intelligibility because nothing is being communicated, and there is no precondition of association between images because the mnemic residues have been disassociated and taken out of context from the structure in which they were perceived. The linguistic structure of the dream is radically distorted from the linguistic structure of conscious thought, which makes understanding the dream in relation to conscious thought even more difficult. Freud's dream analysis and psychoanalysis in general establishes the importance of the relation between the unconscious and conscious thought. It in fact establishes the primacy of unconscious processes in relation to conscious thought, which Lacan translates as the big other, the symbolic structure of language. For Freud and the interpretation of dreams, it is essential to abandon the overvaluation of the property of being conscious before it becomes possible to, possible to form any correct view of the origin of what is mental. The unconscious is a larger sphere, which includes within it the smaller sphere of the conscious. Freud cannot avoid, though, as has been seen, an analysis of the unconscious in the terms of conscious thought. This is given by the supposition that there is an unconscious thought that has similarities with conscious thought. It is primarily the existence of an unconscious that, that is brought into question by the con, in the redefinition of the unconscious as the discourse of the big other, and as that which is structured like a language, but which, as Freud has shown, does not function like a language. The unconscious is seen by Freud as both constituted by repression as a linguistic mechanism and an agent of that repression and of make connaissance in conscious thought. The unconscious is a non-originary origin of repression as the big other is a non-originary origin of méconnaissance for Lacan, <clears throat> and the ego and subjective spirit is a non-originary origin of the self-alienation of reason and objective spirit. 
The ego, which in all three ideologies can be defined as thought itself, is the non-originary origin of psychoanalysis, and the better part of thought is inaccessible to itself. The structure of the Freudian conscious is seen to contain the same internal differences and differentiations as does language and conscious thought that occur in a non-originary origin. In other words, the unconscious can be defined by the quality of the différence of Jacques Lacan or Jacques Derrida in the same way as signification and language, and thus the significance, significance of Lacan in the mechanisms of conscious discourse. <clears throat> The unconscious is equally devoid of the presence of the subject as conscious discourse, as seen in dream construction and the mechanisms of language, and is this, thus the discourse of the big other. <clears throat> the Freudian unconscious represents for Derrida and writing indifference the irreducibility of the effect of deferral, the absence of presence. The conscious text, the interpretation of the dream, for example, cannot be a transcription because there is no text present elsewhere as an unconscious one to be transposed or transported. If the unconscious is the discourse of the big other, which is the source of the subject, then the big other cannot be known to the subject. The subject cannot know its origin, nor the basis of it, nor the basis of its thought. There's no discourse in the unconscious, no communication, nor in dreams, which can be translated into a conscious discourse. There is no unconscious truth to be rediscovered by virtue of having been written elsewhere. There is no text written and present elsewhere which would then be subjected without being changed in the process to an operation and a temporalization, the latter belonging to consciousness if we follow Freud literally, which would be external to it floating on its surface. The dream could not be a hieroglyph, as Freud suggests in the interpretation of dreams, for example, because the signs do not contain a discourse. The unconscious does not exist except as a presence of absence and absence within presence. Thus for Derrida, the unconscious text is always a weave of pure traces, differences in which meaning and force are united, a text nowhere present consisting of archives which are always already transcriptions. This can be seen as has been shown in the structure of dreams. A complex matrix of mnemic residues structured like a language, but with no intention of communication and free of the restrictions of language and conscious discourse. As the primary mechanisms of dream construction are condensation and displacement, corresponding to the mechanisms of metaphor and metonymy and the anticipation of the subject in the signifying chain, signifying presence is both conscious and unconscious thought in both conscious and unconscious thought, is always reconstituted by a deferral, not troglic, belatedly, supplementarily, where the not troglic is also means supplementary. The call of the supplement is primary here, and it hollows out that which will be reconstituted by deferral as the present. The supplement, which seems to be added as a plenitude to a plenitude, is equally that which compensates for a lack. The supplement is tropic language in the linguistics of Lacan is that which reveals the unconscious, the lack which is being supplemented, the absence which is being made present. The sign signifier presents the subject to another signifier and desire is in instituted in the signifying chain as a function of the supplement, a function of the lack in being. For Hegel, desire is the will of subjective spirit towards objective spirit, which is precisely the supplement, conscious discourse, which is the product of the objectification of spirit and reason, which is the objectification of a non-originary origin, an absence which necessitates the self-alienation of reason, which is confirmed by the structuring of the unconscious. The nemic residues are perception which, con which constitute the content of dreams and which can be seen as revealing the presence of the unconscious and conscious thought can be compared to the trace, which Derrida describes as a component of language in Différence. In his positions, Différence is defined as the systemic, systematic play of traces of differences and of the spacing by which signifiers relate to one another. Spacing is the production of intervals without which the full terms could not signify, could not function. Différence is thus the mechanism of the production of differences in signification in the absence of a direct relationship between signifier and signified in the linguistic structure introduced by Saussure.
In deference, the play of differences involves syntheses and referrals that prevent there from being at any moment or in any way a simple element that is present in and of itself and refers only to itself, Derrida says. Thus, whether in written or in spoken discourse, no element can function as a sign without relating to another element which is itself is not simply present. This linkage means that each element, phoneme or grapheme, is constituted with reference to the trace in it of the other elements of the sequence or system. <clears throat> the linkage, linkage is the text, which is produced only through the transformation of another text. Nothing either in the elements or in the system is anywhere simply present or absent. There are only everywhere differences and traces of traces. The trace is as the anchoring point of the con, the RK or point of non-originary origin and signification at which signification is produced retroactively in relation to the subject, and that point is constituted by the absences which have been introduced by presences in the signifying chain. Nemic residues of perception are already traces, presences of absences which are constituted in the dream. If the dream can be compared to a hieroglyph, then the pictographic script of the hieroglyph can only be seen as a trace, a mark which does not correspond to conscious discourse, but which suggests the presence of conscious discourse, as nemic residue suggests the presence of auditory and visual perceptions and memories of dreams and hallucinations. The psyche is thus seen by Freud as a space of writing, but it is a writing which is always exterior and posterior to the spoken word, the auditory perception. Perception is already an inscription, and there is a gap, a play of differences, between what is perceived and what is reconstructed in the mind through the intersection of perception and reason, or the imaginary and symbolic, which manifests itself as the dream. The unconscious is structured like a language, and the language is a play of differences and traces, as in conscious discourse. The trace in both conscious and unconscious discourse is given by the dialectic of the imaginary and symbolic, or subjective and objective spirit, the absence contained in the identification between the image and the word, especially as it contributes to the definition of the subject and the role of the ego in expressive language. As the Klein explains in the essay of structure as an inmixing of an otherness prerequisite to any subject whatever, from the volume The Structuralist Controversy, The Languages of Criticism and the Sciences of Man, in a universe of discourse, nothing contains everything, and here you find again the gap that constitutes the subject. The subject is the introduction of a loss in reality, yet nothing can introduce that, since by status reality is as full as possible. Language, as a necessarily all-inclusive system of signification, cannot contain what is other to itself. As there is a gap between what is perceived and what is represented in language, a gap which is represented by the absence of the subject in language, that gap is manifest by the trace in difference, and the anchoring point in significance is an archaic or primordial gap, a core, the origin of which exceeds the possibility of language as an enclosed system to incorporate. It exceeds the possibility of language to incorporate. The absence of the subject in language is inaccessible to itself, as the unconscious is inaccessible, and it is the function of the symbolic to fill in for it. For Lacan, when the subject takes the place of the lack as the symbolic, a loss is introduced in the word, the pointy capiton, or the trace, and this is the definition of the subject. Language is other to the subject, what I call the otherness of the sphere of language. If language, the chain of signification, is otherness, <clears throat> then the subject is always a fading beneath the chain of signifiers. The signifier does not represent anything to anybody, as opposed to sign or symbol. The signifier only represents a subject to another signifier, <clears throat> the subject which is absent. Desire is a search of the subject to rediscover itself in language, which is impossible. Desire is enacted by the symbolic in the formation of conscious reason, in the absence of the imaginary ego, that part of itself which it seeks to rediscover. The question of desire is that the fading subject yearns to find itself again by means of some sort of encounter with this miraculous thing defined by the phantasm, the lost imaginary ego, Lacan says, the self-identification formed prior to language, the subjective spirit of Hegel.